Thank you. Well, welcome everyone to the next in our series of webinars. This one is about substituting space for time. Um, just a couple of quick announcements. The slides for this, if you happen to be only connecting in audio, uh, are linked directly from the event notice on the front of the screen. Um, there will be a video up on this, uh, recording of this, probably within the next day. And just to reiterate what Mike had said, this event is being recorded and will be publicly available. So as John Denver liked to say, if you're going to sing along, sing good. With that, Eric. Well, okay. Um, so this is a topic that was, I think, originally proposed by Everett Schock and then put together by Everett and Eric Boyd and me. Um, the Everett was the one to originate the, the title, I think, How Can We Substitute Space for Time to Better Understand Geochemical and Coevolutionary Dynamics? Um, the space for time refers to something that's essentially uh, well known. A lot of what happens in geochemistry and evolutionary dynamics and the coupling between the two occurs on time scales that are not accessible to us experimentally. Uh, usually, you would want the control of experiments to do things like infer out of sample, which is relevant for detecting uh, preferred places to look for life outside the Earth, and also understanding cause, because without a model, you can't simply infer from a sample what happens outside the sample conditions. Uh, the problem when you have no direct access to deep time is that you may have variation in the present, but simple sample comparison of diversity does not directly get you at causation or at out-of-sample inference. So then the question is, what can we do to make, how can we, in a principled way, use variation in the present to provide access to the things about the past that are needed for inference and for the deduction of cause? Three obvious ways this can be done, which are not limited to biology, they occur also in geology and many other areas. If you have processes that are continuously reinitiated, you can catch them at different stages, and so you can substitute uh, synchronic comparison for diachronic comparison in that way. Um, when there are accidental components or historically contingent components in the production of diversity, you can use those to reconstruct history with phylogenetic methods. And by then filling in the events of the past, you can try to use those events to correct for things like Galton's problem to understand likelihood or context for the changes rather than simply looking at the diversity as it occurs now. Uh, and this, particularly for us, this will be of interest for the relation between metabolic phenotypes and ways of living and the geological context where they occur. And then, of course, the other thing that goes together with reconstructing accidental parts of the past is inferring a process model for what the laws are that have been active in evolution over that time. So why is this uh, a thing that clearly there's a lot we can do with? The biosphere is enormously diverse. It's diverse in its gene inventory. It's diverse in the way genes are gathered into genomes. It's diverse in the way organisms ontogenetically or developmentally produce phenotype from a combination of genes and environments. And it's diverse in ecological assembly. And a lot of the diversity in ontogeny or development and ecology is coupled to the types of geochemical environments uh, and thermodynamic environments that different organisms and their communities can inhabit. So working from that, what are the guiding questions um, in making use of the rich data record that phylogenomic diversity makes available to us? OK, most basic question of life, how did it originate, and then how, how and why was the diversity of life on Earth produced as it was? Um, particularly with application to metabolism, what are the metabolic features that we can reconstruct for early life, and how do they give us a principled way um, to choose places to investigate and also modes of investigation for astrobiology? With regard to the question of whether or not there are time-independent processes that can be inferred, the sorts of things for which we already have some evidence, but we would like a more systematic understanding, are some environments more conservative, both geologically and in the mode and tempo of evolution that they induce, than others are? Can we say something about which types of environments are which? When organisms diversify, 
Some of that may come from the bottlenecks of evolutionary discovery, but some of it may also come from strict limits that are imposed geologically, either on the organism or on the community structure of the organism. Um, sometimes the limitations on community structure may come from limitations in what individual species can do. Other times the limits on community structure may be more fundamental to the community than they are to the individual. And it's worth noting in all of these that all evolution essentially is coevolution. It's a very rare geological environment that can be inhabited by only one species that's not affected by the dynamics of other species that share it. And in everything from phylogenetic reconstruction to understanding evidence about species interactions um, in genomic records, what you would like is to be able to calibrate mode and tempo of evolution to figure out what's happening in the same places at the same time. So why is this not an easy thing to do? A lot of time has expired. The geological intervals that are given names are to some extent historical, but in many respects they have to do with actually uh, different chemistry, different um, rock dynamics, and different behavior of the atmosphere and oceans, and also different phases of life and feedbacks of life on the geochemical environment. And we have to look back through all of that in order to correctly interpret the diversity that we find in the record today. As just one example, um, you know, so life or, life's origins are somewhere in the murky area between the Hadean, the Hidden Era, and the early Archean, where we have some ability to start talking about the chemistry of rocks and oceans. Um, between then and now, we have a whole sequence of major transitions. And as an example, you know, many of the major transitions in life were actually major transitions of the biogeochemical environment all jointly. This is a slide from Ariel Anbar's science paper in 2008, which just tracks elemental abundances in the ocean uh, jointly with the rise of oxygen as it's approximately inferred, to, inferred today. And both through direct interactions with molecular oxygen and particularly through things like the oxidation states of sulfur and what that makes soluble or insoluble, you see that you have many orders of magnitude change especially in transition metals that are fundamental to biochemical functions. And these determine both what it was thermodynamically affordable to do, and to some extent, they may have affected the partitioning of the way elements occur in different organisms. So for instance, you see that zinc and copper are extremely low concentration in anoxic oceans, and then with the rise of oxygen, at the same time as iron, molybdenum, cobalt, nickel are driven out of solution, zinc and copper come into solution. So there can be different eras in evolutionary innovation that are coupled to just what's available. And of course, life is feeding back. It was organism dynamics that created this. So the sequence of the next several slides have to do um, with particular areas where we can say something about what's in the genome inventory, how it couples within the ecosystem and also to the geochemistry that are sort of examples of how problems of this kind can be solved. So I'll switch off at this point and transfer to Eric Boyd uh, to do those. Okay, so Eric did a nice job of outlining some of the barriers uh, to these kind of studies and really outlined why uh, we think that these kind of studies are necessary to understand why we have uh, the diversification uh, of life that, that, that we have today and really trying to understand how we got there. And so there's a, a critical feature of microbial life that, that we believe makes uh, these kind of studies tractable, and that is that, they, that life uh, tends to inherit uh, their genotypes or their ge genomes and thus their phenotypes um, from their ancestors. Okay, and so to the extent that an ecology of an organism, so the environment that an organism tends to inhabit, is related to uh, what they can do or their their, their phenotype, uh, there should be a positive relationship there. And so uh, really guiding this work from here forward is is the tenet that genomes are a data-rich historical record of, of the interactions between life and its environment. And it's a data-rich record that we believe far exceeds the geological record. So uh, much has happened, there's many gaps in the geological record. Uh, there's there's uh, really large barriers to understanding uh, uh, what what the environment might have been like, uh, say, two billion years ago or whatnot. And we think that we can actually mine 
this information out of uh, existing genomes. And so uh, as we start uh, down this path, um, I just put this plot in here to illustrate this, this basic tenet of microbiology, and that is as a species diversifies, as it increases its phylogenetic distance from its ancestor, um, what you tend to see is a, a corresponding increase in the metabolic dissimilarity of those organisms. And so this is taking 1,800 genomes uh, comprising both bacteria and archaea, um, defining what their uh, uh, metabolic capacity is using a series of statistical and bioinformatic tools that I won't go into here, and just simply creating a matrix to describe how similar uh, those organisms are at a metabolic level. And then relating that to a matrix describing how evolutionarily related uh, those organisms are. And so what you can see from that is that there is a correspondence. So as you uh, evolve new metabolic traits or new uh, combinations of metabolic traits, there's a corresponding uh, diversification um, at an evolutionary level. And so the question is, is what drove the development of this phenotypic diversity? So, so to the extent that environment or interspecies interactions are driving or providing new uh, ecological niches, uh, how did that select for new uh, metabolic properties of these organisms? And so just to, to simplify a little bit and take us a step back to things that I think most of us understand, we can go back to Darwin's work back in the 1800s. And, you know, Darwin, without the benefit of genomics and without the benefit of, of phylogenetics, uh, started to notice this pattern in, in beak morphology of these finches and found a tight correlation between the morphology of these finch beaks and the lifestyle strategies that these finches lived. And that is, uh, what kind of foraging habit, habits did they have? Uh, what kind of food resources did they use? And noticed a correspondence in uh, the beak morphology um, of these organisms and their local environment, okay? And so here we're not necessarily talking about a chemical environment. We're talking about a food resource. But, you know, let's think back to microbes and their food resource, at least in, in most systems, are, are chemicals. And so uh, uh, just using this as an analogy and and, and what was particularly striking to me is this work by Sato uh, back in 1999 uh, took these finches and actually subjected those, the, these finch uh, populations to phylogenetic reconstruction and showed that uh, lifestyle strategy or their phenotypes tracked very nicely with their evolutionary history, uh, which is exactly what you would expect if metabolic innovation is driving taxonomic uh, diversification. And so, the essence of these slides is that uh, we believe that you can begin to understand the role of environment in shaping biodiversity by examining patterns in the distribution of species and their functions, okay? And so a framework that uh, we've used uh, in, in moving this research forward is really uh, can be summed up by this Venn diagram here where we have uh, uh, ecological interactions, and by this I mean uh, an organism's um, ability to interact with its environment, its environmental tolerances, uh, biological interactions. These get a little bit more difficult to um, decipher uh, when we're looking back in time. Um, and then we have evolution. And so these two interactions are, are together uh, converging to drive evolutionary phenomena. And the way to really think about this is at the level of, of the ecological niche, which is simply the multiplicity of chemical, physical, and importantly, biological parameters that characterize a local habitat. And so then biology through mutagenesis, every time a cell replicates, uh, mut mutations are introduced into the genome, creating new opportunities uh, to evolve new phenotypic traits or trait variants that enable that population to successfully compete and proliferate uh, potentially in a new uh, ecological niche. Okay, and so interactions then in that newly expanded upon niche uh, uh, ultimately dictate the success of these diversification events. And so it's a fairly simple framework, and obviously you can get more complicated with it, um, but I think it leads you uh, to, to ask a couple of, of fairly simple questions of biological data. So evolutionary history is informative, okay? So what was the role of analyte X? So this can be 
whatever your favorite compound is in driving the diversification of lineage wide. Again, that can be whatever your favorite lineage is. And so you can ask these questions um, in any number of combinations and ask how the evolutionary history of these populations uh, or communities even was shaped by uh, environmental variation. Um, we also believe that the distribution of lineages is informative. So what environment types harbor the earliest branching lineages, for example, um, focusing in on some of the major uh, transitions um, in, in, in life uh, on Earth, such as photosynthesis, what kind of environment types uh, uh, dictate the distribution of that, that, those kind of processes? Okay, so how, how do we go about answering these, these questions? So going back to Eric's slide number two, you know, how can we actually use space to, and substitute that for, for time? And so we believe, again, that the genomes of extant organisms are a data-rich record by which we can mine, that we can mine uh, at a phylogenetic level to understand um, how environmental gradients uh, that have played out over, uh, over geological time have dictated the extant distribution of life. And so what kind of a system would, would serve us well uh, uh, for such studies? And of course, uh, my work with Everett takes us to Yellowstone often to ask these kind of questions. And the reason why is here's just a plot of, of I think, 1,400 springs in Yellowstone as a function of their pH and temperature space. And you can see that you can sample uh, any gradient of pH and temperature combinations. Uh, combinations. You can expand on this uh, to virtually any analyte uh, of interest, aside from pressure and maybe salinity, and you can sample uh, orders of magnitude gradients, spatial gradients in these, uh, in these analytes. And so then you can take and you can sample microbial communities across these gradients, subject them to phylogenetic analysis or a series of analyses, and ask, you know, what the, the historical pattern is there. So when we do this with something like photosynthesis, so uh, we call this the transition to photosynthesis. I don't know if you can see my cursor here on the screen, but so starting in the center of this uh, panel on the left, uh, we have an acidic hot spring um, uh, in Yellowstone. Uh, the source is up near the top there where you see that yellow, uh, that's elemental sulfur. And as that spring uh, emanates outward from the source, it cools, uh, forms a gradient, and ultimately you can see green and purple um, life forms appear. Well, those are, those are phototrophs. Um, and so there's something about the, the, the source fluid of this system that's constraining photosynthesis, uh, not allowing it to compete in, in that environment. And here's an environment here on the right. Uh, this is roadside spring, another uh, spring uh, close to, to uh, Norris Geyser Basin. It has a different pH and temperature regime, and we can see that that, uh, that transition from a largely chemosynthetic uh, community uh, to one that's photosynthetic occurs at a different pH and temperature regime. Okay, and so we took and we mapped uh, the distribution of photosynthesis um, and I think roughly 450 different hot, or 440 hot springs in Yellowstone. And, and this is just three analytes that we've measured. We measured temperature, pH, and sulfide. And we just simply asked the question, uh, where do we find photosynthesis evidence for it, genetic or uh, biochemical evidence for photosynthesis, and where do we not? And the first thing I'd like to point your attention to is this panel on the left. Now, this is the distribution of photosynthesis as a function of temperature and pH. And what do we see? Well, we see... Uh, kind of a stepwise uh, function there, where at pH 5, uh, you see photosynthesis in, in the systems with pH greater than 5, we see photosynthesis all the way up to about 73 degrees centigrade. And below this uh, uh, t uh, pH realm, the more acidic systems, uh, we see photosynthesis more constrained uh, to lower, lower temperature environments. And so what is this telling us? Well, we think uh, that this is telling us that photosynthesis, it's very unlikely photosynthesis originated in a hot spring with a temperature greater than 73 degrees centigrade. Uh, we think that there's something very unique about this 73 degrees centigrade upper temperature limit um, that is keeping photosynthesis from diversifying into those into those environmental realms. And I actually had a very nice discussion with uh, with Eric, my co-presenter here, about what this 
what might be defining this upper temperature limit. We uh, started really, well, we, we spent about 30 minutes that we should have been using to prepare for this presentation talking about what, what this might reflect. And, and it got very interesting talking about inorganic carbon availability, potentially the constraints that that places on uh, uh, the ability for these organisms to get rid of uh, reducing equivalents or electrons uh, that they're gener that they generate through photosynthesis, they can't really regulate photosynthesis, uh, and their inability to get rid of those electrons. So at this uh, 73 degree temperature limit, perhaps they're uh, they're they're just burning up with energy. What about this uh, this this step function that occurs here at about pH five? Well, that turns out to be a strict demarcation between cyanobacterial dominated systems at about between pH four and five and above versus algal dominated systems uh, below uh, below this pH realm. So if we now transition over to panel B, uh, we have mapped the distribution of photosynthesis as a function of temperature and sulfide. We can see that there appears to be an upper temperature or an upper sulfide limit uh, for for most of these phototrophs. And I should mention that this is is probably Yellowstone specific as there's uh, known to be some cyanobacteria that tolerate much higher concentrations of sulfide than this. And so for whatever reason, those, those organisms aren't successful in Yellowstone. But um, anyway, so we saw this data and we decided, well, this is interesting. Let's see if we can't uh, understand what the effect of sulfide is on photosynthetic activities. We picked a couple algal-dominated systems and a couple cyanobacterial-dominated systems. And we showed that cyanobacteria don't seem to be sensitive to sulfide. Okay, but the al algal populations, uh, CO2 fixation systematically uh, uh, goes down uh, with increasing sulfide concentration, suggesting that so something, may, perhaps sulfide gradients, might have uh, impacted uh, uh, the evolution of, of, of algae and how the ability for eukaryotes to, to perform photosynthesis. And this final slide, I'm just going to cut to the chase here. Um, this is uh, about 30, 30 communities in Yellowstone that we generated metagenomic sequence data. So that is uh, randomly sequence uh, total genomic DNA from these communities uh, through a series of bioinformatic uh, tools uh, that, that get a little complex. We generate a comparative analysis of the metabolic composition of these communities or the genetic composition of these communities. So those communities that are sh separated by short branch links here are more similar uh, metabolically than those that are uh, separated by longer branch links. And what you can see here um, very simply uh, is this demarcation between photosynthetic and chemosynthetic ecosystems. And if we think back uh, to this transition that we noted in our distribution uh, analysis, you, you can pretty much overlay that right here. So as we transition from chemotrophic uh, communities to phototrophic communities, you know, whatever that was 2.8 billion years ago, uh, all hell broke loose metabolically, all kinds of new uh, metabolic innovations. Um, the second thing I want to point out on this slide, I don't have it clearly delineated here, but within that chemotrophic cluster, uh, there's, two, there's two primary clusters, subclusters. One of these is, uh, comprises uh, communities that inhabit circum-neutral to alkaline systems, and the other uh, comprises uh, communities that inhabit acidic systems. And that demarcation is right there at about pH 5. And so there's something about systems that are uh, uh, alkaline or circum-neutral that select for different metabolic functions uh, than those that are acidic. Now, this analysis, uh, as interesting as it might be, uh, is not where Eric and I would like to see it at. And what we would really like to do, and what we're really proposing uh, here in this white paper, is to take this data, to take this data that we already have, and turn it and, and, and really analyze it within a phylogenetic framework. So the problem with this data set as it exists, we can't establish trajectory. Okay? We can map geochemical gradients on this very easily, uh, but we can't map trajectory. And so. Uh, to really link this, this uh, space for time argument and make use of it, we, we want to feed this into uh, a phylogenetic context or a phylogenomic context, and then at that point really start looking at specific metabolic pathways, how they evolved, when they evolved, and what kind of environment types seem to have selected for, uh, 
for the innovation of those of those uh, metabolisms. And then finally, if we're able to get that far in our analyses, uh, what we really think should be done is we think that we should integrate reaction kinetics into these models. And so you can make the argument that, that geochemistry is extremely important uh, in, in the diversification of life. Uh, without a doubt, that was the case. But something that's very difficult to incorporate into those kind of considerations is the fact that some reactions uh, have huge kinetic barriers uh, to biology, and maybe they don't have such high kinetic barriers to, to abiotic uh, reactions. And so uh, the example that, that uh, I like to use is, so we've, we've all heard of these, these really interesting ophiolite uh, systems, such as Lost City, where they're generating massive quantities of hydrogen uh, abiotically. Well, if you're a fermentative organism, you're an organism that's fermenting formate, or you're fermenting whatever your favorite organic molecule is, and you critically depend on uh, low partial pressures of hydrogen uh, to run that reaction forward, to take that reaction forward, uh, that's not going to be a great place for you to, to be catalyzing these processes. You could also think about this as you have these uh, ophiolite sequences that are cat catalyzing the reduction of CO2. Uh, producing formate as an intermediate on its way to, to methane. Uh, if you are an organism that wants to uh, squeak out a living on using a formate as an electron or carbon source, uh, and that abiotic reaction, that abiotic reduction of formate to methane is too fast for you to keep up, um, you're out of luck, right? There's no energy to be had for you. And so ideally, you know, focusing on a couple of reactions that we think are important for early life, uh, we might be able to get at this, these kind of questions uh, and integrate this greater consideration into these models that, that uh, we, we would hope would be developed. Um, and I guess just to summarize, the, the point here is, is how can we take advantage of extant distributions of, of, of life and their metabolic strategies to guide our understanding of what early life uh, metabolic strategies were and how they diversified, okay? And so really trying to understand what the role of environment and environmental variation is in those events. How can we integrate abiotic reaction kinetics into these models? Uh, this is something that, that has been avoided and probably with good reason because it's not easy to do these kind of experiments uh, or, or uh, integrate those into your models. Um, but how can we use abiotic reaction, uh, uh, reaction kinetic, kinetics to further uh, our understanding of, of what early life might have been up against? We didn't talk much about the role of interspecies interactions, but certainly, uh, as Eric mentioned, uh, there's very few environments that are, are, are monospecies environments. Typically, you have uh, a very complex community, and so you can't neglect uh, the role of, of interspecies interactions um, in dictating coevolutionary dynamics. Um, and I guess finally, you know, why would any astrobiologist care? You know, how can we use the information that we would gain from such of an, these analyses uh, to guide or improve uh, guiding uh, uh, site selection for, for missions? And uh, Eric and I both think that uh, by focusing on these early, early life uh, sustaining uh, metabolisms, exploitation of small energetic gradients, um, that those are the kind of metabolisms that we most likely see on another planet, um, and, and that could provide some new insight in, in, in that regard. And so with that, that's the end of our presentation. Uh, it would be great to open this up for uh, any discussion that people might have. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much. Um, just while you were doing the presentation, we switched the document so it's now open for adding comments. Um, I can see there are several people in here. It's helpful if you can actually log in with your Google ID just so the authors can see who's writing what. So if you're logged in and you know you are Anonymous Narwhal or Anonymous Wombat, as Google likes to give you these names, it's great if before you add your comments, you could just uh, authenticate. If for some reason that doesn't work, then it's worth sticking your name in um, when you add your virtual post-it notes. So um, at this point, well, I can see Dave is, uh, is typing comments already, but the, the audio lines are now open. 
Uh, Jennifer, I, I've noticed that you're sort of coming in and out of the space, so I'm presuming there's slight technical problems there, but hopefully you're still with us on audio. Um, so, questions, observations, what should the authors be thinking about and how can we help them strengthen their paper? Well, Dave is typing. Lindsay, I know that just recently you've always wanted to ask questions with regards to uh, where this would shape um, activities, but I don't want to put words into your mouth. So what is it you're normally asking hey. the presenters to put? Go on. Yeah, so I mean, I, this is this is sort of a question that we've been trying to, to move forward with, and that's sort of, you know, this... I, I know this topic is. I find this one um, very interesting, and you know, I think that there's there's certainly a, in some ways, this feels like a very long term view of how to view this. But what specifically do you guys think is more? Um, what kind of things do you think are more likely to be? You know, what we're going to look at in the next ten years, um, rather than sort of the the very long view. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll take the first crack at that. I, I don't think that this is a very uh, a, a real long-term view at all. I think with the expanse of genome sequence technology, I mean, it's, it's absolutely crazy what you can generate a metagenome for, $100, $200 these days. You have the samples that span that 1,440 geochemical or hot spring gradient that I showed you. Um, and we have the bioinformatic tools to make this happen. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble with my light. The sun just keeps moving on me. Um, anyway, I so I don't think it necessarily is, uh, at least on that first part, the that this is a very long-term goal. I think we can do this now. Um, so you're thinking that kind of thing is the kind of thing you're looking at in the next 10 years? Uh, Metagenome well, studies and that kind of thing. I think you can do it with metagenomes. I think you can do it with metatranscriptomes, which would even get more interesting, right? So you can start looking at, um, you could even look at temporal dynamics within a system and how that's causing metabolic complexity to evolve. And, um, but I, you know, this is all stuff that I think the the integrating abiotic reaction kinetics or even biological reaction kinetics into these models is is where the challenge is. Um, and that's that to me is where we need to go. Um, but Eric, I don't know if you have anything to add. Yeah, I'd like to pick up on that and uh, agreeing with you to to say some some more things of a similar sort. Um, and hi, Lindsay. You know, it seems. Hey, Eric. Here. There are basic things about the notion of cause and the notion of regulation where we spend a lot of time taking for granted when in fact we have the data to actually try to understand instead. Um, too many things are organism focused. We're at the level of basically trying to model constraints like full metabolism models for organisms. It still is just the leading edge to try to understand the regulation of metabolism within organisms. But there's a lot of reason, I would argue, to say that a lot of constraint or causation or even regulation of chemical reaction input-output systems is not controlled at the organism level. It's controlled at the ecosystem level, and it's mediated by organism dynamics. But um, the, the point Eric was making where you can do dendrograms and you can do similarity relations at the sort of ecosystem level, metabolic competence level, you would really like to pair that with an organism phylogenetic reconstruction because what you get from organism histories are two things. One is the dependency sequence, and then the other is the degree of treeness or reticulation, which gives you some sense of where you need to know or don't need to know the ecological context to know what the determinants were of opportunities for innovation. And I feel like this is a place to actually get conceptually at where cause and regulation are going on in biology. It's it's. Not a, I was going to say something that would get me in trouble, but I think better of it. Um, 
it's not a particularly scientifically well-defended point of view to just suppose that everything happens at the level of the organism. And, you know, the, the tools we have, both for modeling and just for data analysis, allow us to frame a lot of those questions in a less prejudiced way. And I think that's stuff we can do in, in real time with what we already have. Gentlemen, do you see uh, the the question that, that Dave has typed into your chat window? Uh, I do. I'm reading now. Uh, I was going to say to give you a no, moment to, to. It was typing for so long. <clears throat> so, um, the uh, the connectivity of extreme environments. You know, I absolutely. You know, our hot springs are the best environments to study origin of life. Um, type phenomena? Uh, pro probably not, right? I mean, for the reasons that you indicate here, also because they, jet, they you know, uh, a, a little known fact is that they get a lot of support from their external environment, which is, you know, adjacent soils and so on and so forth. So they're connected. Uh, you're making the claim that maybe some of these organisms don't have actually a heritage in these systems and actually recently invaded these systems and and I think that's partially true for subdominant players but the dominant players in all of the systems at least that I've ever looked at um, have a strong hydrothermal uh, early life uh, hydrothermal heritage um, where I would where I think um, you know if we're going to improve site selection for you know some of these these missions. What what do we need to do? Well, I think uh, moving from surface hot spring type systems or surface uh, well, m moving into the deep subsurface, right? So drilling in a in a hydrothermal system, um, looking at uh, uh, some of these subsurface ophiolites and understanding how those organisms are exploiting small energetic gradients. And I, I think that, to me, is the key uh, parameter to focus in on. It's not the heat. It's not the low pH or the high pH. It's, it's energetic gradients that are small. And how does life uh, uh, develop a strategy uh, to support itself uh, based on those small energetic gradients? And are there, and this is key, are there some unique biomarkers, whether it be a gaseous biomarker, um, a metabolic biomarker, a biochemical marker uh, for those kind of organisms that we can exploit uh, in our search for life elsewhere. Um, that would be my uh, comments on, on, on your, your comment, Dave. Yeah, I just put it out mostly as a cautionary note about how far you can push phylogenetics in this. Uh, because, as you guys know much better than I, that when organisms associate in communities, that gene transfers and stuff tend over time to homogenize them. And some of the earliest evidence for the antiquity of photosynthesis is really uh, it's sort of functional space more than than uh, than um, you know what is, what is the word I want to talk about um, sequence similarity in in on some of the molecules that code for it. So um, you know it's just that I think. This is sort of like when you go to Mars looking for life, you have to worry about terrestrial contamination. When you do this, you have to worry about, <laughs> quote, contamination from things that are really not intrinsically, intrinsic principles of living in an extreme environment. So just just sort of a cautionary yeah. tone about phylogeny. Yeah, well, I think I think the <clears throat> I, I definitely understand what, what you're saying, but I think the point is is that unless you have a heritage an evolutionary history that allows whatever function that is that you got. You know, so it's ecology really defines the success of horizontal gene transfer. You're not going to see genes transferred from um, organisms, one from an acidophile and one from an alkalophile, very often. Right? You see it often within an, acidophil in an acid environment or an alkaline environment. And so there are environmental barriers to, to gene transfer, and because of that, when you think about these systems at the ecosystem level, like Eric just mentioned, um, those kind of considerations become less of a concern. Um, you know, when you're talking, I mean, yeah, that, that's that's all I'd have to say about that. 
Yeah, I was, I was worried more about comparisons of genes within a given environment uh, where organisms might have come from a variety of, of, of sources. But you're right on. I think it's, it's the process that's required to survive in that environment that is the, is the key thing to uh, keep in the front. Yeah, and there's a good thing to, to keep in mind here, which is that phylogenetics is not an oracle. Um, Phylogenetics is one indication of relatedness or dependency, which winds up being used in a very multi-factor argument. And you know, this point that Eric just made about the, the sort of not only species separation environments, but entire phenotype, phenotype class separations, the amazing thing is that you can see that in phylogenetic signatures exactly where you would most not expect to see it from the standpoint of gene transfer. So you look at innovations in carbon fixation, and not taking any historical perspective, you can say, how can one lay out all known innovations in carbon fixation just to see how they depend on each other? And the thing that's staggering is that they reconstruct as a tree, much better than most of the protein families from most genes in the organisms that use them reconstruct as a tree. And you think that's crazy. Why would there be treeness at the deep layers when gene transfer is easiest? And one possible explanation for that is that the environments are so strongly in training what the organisms can do that essentially you can't transport a certain gene inventory far outside the environment where it's well selected without the organisms just becoming non-viable. And so you get these tree-like dependencies that are not accidents of inheritance, but just the fact that environments don't mix without in the course of changing. So I think, yeah, that's great. you know, absolutely your point is very well taken that one must always be thinking and not using these tools in a, a kind of a mindless way. But in a multi-factor argument, I think there's a lot that we can do with care. Agreed. Other, other questions or observations that people would like to share? No? Okay. In that case, gentlemen, thank you. Um, Eric Boyd, I'd also like to thank probably the graduate student who did some great photo bombing behind you, just poking her head through the little window in the door. <laughs> yeah, she's been to get a hold of me until about two minutes before we started this, so it's been, I've been hearing her knocking. How does that sound? <laughs> oh, right. Well, you can you can say she's contributed to a webinar on astrobiology. Um, it's probably citable, although I'm not sure what the format for citing that is. Um, okay, so uh, particularly if you're watching this recording uh, afterwards, I also encourage you to go to the document. It's open for comments. Um, and that is about it for now. So, gentlemen, thank you very much, and thank you, everyone, for attending. Cheerio. Bye-bye. Thanks, Andy. Thank you.